chaos and uh, computing. And today there will be another chaos story, but a radically different one, namely um, chaos in uh, gravity, which um, in the course of the last mm, four or five years or so has become a really quite intensively researched subject in, in the field of gravity. For example, we have Ma Martin Sieber here. I, I know I, I know for a fact that at this point, many, if not the majority of the, the string theory people know the name. I mean, Ma Martin and his um, Sieber Richter corrections and all that. So this became all very popular. And I want to try uh, to tell you the story um, how this came about. Yeah, I mean, so this is and. Um, uh, j just to, to get you tuned, um, <coughs> the talk, I mean, the, the first two thirds of the talk will be um, very easy to understand for everybody. I mean, most of that you know. Um, I, I will, will retell elements of um, quantum chaos in a language geared towards a later like, uh, application to gravity. The remaining, I mean, then it gets progressively more weird. I mean, we go into this gravity direction. The idea is not, and I, I can't do that, I mean, to, to, to be fully understandable, I just want to give you a flavor, I mean, or a teaser of uh, the, the kind of concepts um, uh, people are thinking about. And ideally, that gets you interested and you start reading about this. There are several nice articles out there on the archive. Okay, so <coughs> um, there used to be... Um, is it switched on? Yeah. So there they is this field of um, gravity, in particular um, quantum gravity. And um, you probably know that one of the biggest problems out there, if not the fundamental problem, is to understand the principles of gravity all the way from classical Einstein general relativity to which I'm blocking here, what, what stands there is the um, microstates, the actual quantum microstates of the black hole. Yeah, the black hole is a um, very small object. It's governed by principles of quantum mechanics. We have this in mind somehow. There is a spectrum, and we would like to understand all this from, from the classical physics, and this is a super hard and unsolved problem. Now, um, recently, there has been some progress, not in, in, in solving this in generality, but um, in the toy context of two-dimensional gravity. I mean, two-dimensional two gravity is a super simple toy reduction of, of gravity. But even that is, is um, non-trivial. <coughs> and um, what's been instrumental in making this progress within this reduced context, and of course with the hope of, of extending these ideas to higher dimensional settings, uh, was the confluence of two, um, if you want, um, concepts. The first is the um, holographic principle. I, I will review that in a, a little later on, but quite importantly, in connection with chaos. Why chaos? Because, well, ultimately, it's about black holes. Black holes are the most efficient information scrambler we can think of, and we everybody believes that they are, they are governed by principles of, of chaos. Yeah. Um, now, it is this kind of development which I want to uh, review. And the uh, talk is organized as follows. I, I, I mean, I, I start with discussing quantum chaos. I mean, reviewing elements of quantum chaos which we need for our story. And all that you will find here quite familiar, I guess. And um, then we proceed in two steps. I will uh, then talk about how this chaos um, manifest itself first in what I call semi-classical gravity. I mean, you will understand what, I, what we mean by that. And then, uh, crucially, uh, we will um, find that in order to make the story complete, we cannot stop here. We actually have to uh, add, add, I mean, or sprinkle in elements of string theory. Too. And so, so this will come out quite naturally. And this is more or less um, the story. And yeah, interrupt me if, if anything is unclear. I mean, usual rules of the game, yeah? Oh. So, um, chaos, quick review. What, what do we need? Um, I want to focus uh, on, the, on, on what we had, I mean, before here. Um, the ergodic phase of quantum chaos. Ergodic is important, yeah? So, think of a uh, generic ergodic quantum. Forget gravity for the time being. And what I want to 
um, stress is that there are just two fundamental phenomenological signatures we need to describe ergodic quantum chaos. The first is that quantum states are maximally random, uh, as entropic as I get, so they are, if you want, um, uniformly Gaussian distributed over Hilbert space, um, and this goes along with concepts such as ETH and maximum entropy of states and so on. Um, what's more important for us is the structure of the spectrum. And um, you know that here, I mean that the spectrum of ergodic quantum systems looks strangely ordered. I mean, it, this is level repulsion. It's at least it appears to be much more ordered, um, if you look at it with a naked eye, than the typical spectrum of an integrable system, like an atom or whatever. Yeah? So the, and this is level repulsion. I mean, and that will be quite important for us. So let's quickly recap. We had this before, um, how to uh, characterize um, this kind of uh, spectra and their residual weak fluctuations of these levels. We do that by looking again at our um, two-point correlation function, measuring the correlations of density of states at slightly different energies. We measure energy in units, natural units of the um, problem, the average level spacing, and then obtain here this dimensionless um, function depending on a single dimensionless parameter characterizing the spectra um, the statistics of the spectra. Now, um, how do these correlation functions look? We have seen them before, but um, <coughs> I, I want to re-emphasize some fundamental features of the spectral two-point correlation functions. So, um, they all look qualitatively like this. I mean, the oscillatory and with, I mean, decaying at large um, energy differences. The fine print depends a little bit on which symmetry class you are in but they all have this, this structure in common. And um, what I want to emphasize is that <coughs> we should always, in the analysis of these functions, distinguish between a large energy regime. I mean, energy is much larger than the average level spacing. And that's a regime which I uh, call a semi-classical regime, in the sense that it is accessible to principles of semi-classical quantum mechanics. And what we have here um, what, or what, what we observe in this regime is the gradual decay of correlations in powers of 1 over s, yeah? typically 1 over s squared or something like that. So a power law vanishing of correlations at large energy dis uh, differences, <coughs> and this is to be distinguished from the physics for small s, I mean s of the order or smaller than the level spacing, which is in a way the deep quantum regime, I mean the, the level spacing enters the game, the smallest scale you, you have in the problem. And here there are two um, signatures to be stressed. The first is um, level repulsion. These functions start as minus one. W you will never ever find two levels sitting at the same point. This is as minus one starting. And then we have this crystalline fluctuations um, telling that once you have a level, the next one will be a delta, two delta, and so on. So this, this manifests in these fluctuations. So you all know that, but we, this we have to refer to this structure later on quite extensively. Um, in people in gravity, for some reasons, which I'm not fully understand, but that's what they do, they, they, they prefer to talk about the spectral form factor, which is a Fourier transform of this function, and it has this celebrated, in fact, it was in gravity started with this nomenclature, ramp plateau. Yeah, these days, everybody calls this ramp plateau. Gravity people started with this, so it's in the unitary case, as you know, you have a linear increase and then a plateau. In other symmetry classes, it looks a little more complicated. But um, this here is a time-like description of the semi-classical regime, short times, large energies, and here we have the quantum regime. All right, so um, these are the objects statistic or statistically describing the spectrum. And um, you also know that <coughs> you can make this quantitative, I mean, by different methods for some classes of microscopic systems or by, by using um, random ra matrix techniques. So we can um, quantitatively compute these functions in various symmetry classes. And um, what I want to stress here is, and it's again something you know, is an ultra high level of universality in this game. Yeah, I mean, in the sense that this behavior here is shown by all quantum systems that are ergodic. Um, just distinguishing the, the symmetry classes, no matter whether they, and this is a stupid cartoon language here. I mean, this, this can be condensed matter systems, strongly interacting systems. 
AMO systems, billiards if you want, or indeed gravity. Yeah? So there is this large set of, of universality. And then the, the natural question of quantum chaos, one of the oldest questions, is how do, can we understand this level of universality? How can we conceptualize it? I mean, why, how, how comes? And you all know that there, are, uh, there, is, uh, there is one famous answer out there, which um, I call it, if you want, the constructive approach. I mean, that's another way of phrasing the bohigas Janoni schmidt conjecture. And the statement here is as follows. If you have lots and lots of microscopically different systems, and they all show the same type of spectral correlations, I mean, all the same, then there must be one proxy, I mean, a very simple a reduction, a maximally simple reference or model system that already ex exemplifies this type or um, shows this behavior. And this, this proxy is the random matrix Hamiltonian. So, um, Bohigas Janoni Schmidt, in a way, is to say that there is this kind of uh, random matrix universality in the sense that spectra of microscopic systems can be described, already modeled via maximally entropic means Gaussian distributed high dimensional random matrices. It's a triviality, yeah? Would you all know, know that. I'm phrasing this in this way to emphasize that this is only one way of understanding this universality. This is one which is popular, and um, here's the other, uh, an alternative one. Um, if you have lots of microscopic systems and they all show the same behavior, then it's probable that they, there is a that they have a common mean field theory. Like, suppose you have lots of different magnets, and they all show the same universal, universal magnetization phenomena, then there must be a common mean field theory describing them all, which in this case would be the phi to the 4 theory. Yeah? So there must be something like the phi to the 4 theory of quantum chaos. And um, this indeed exists. It um, was introduced in 1980, 1981, some, some kind of mean field theory um, of this field, and I, I'll show it in in, in, um, a little later, I mean, you, you, here, here in this audience, it's no surprise, this is a nonlinear Sika model, which we discussed before, yeah? But please appreciate that these are conceptually somewhat different approaches to universality. One is to say we have a proxy system. The other one is to say that all systems, really all, of quantum chaos, including gravity, must reduce to this theory in the extreme infrared limit. In infrared meaning if you probe spectra spectral structures. Yeah, this is um, a mantra which we will use later on. Okay, now, um, next point I want to discuss is <coughs> how, how can we make this concrete? I mean, <coughs> how can we actually compute spectral correlation functions um, in, in constructive terms? And the route I want to um, use here as an, I mean, to, 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 towards answering this question, and uh, because, I mean, an, an old problem which has long been solved, I'm just reviewing it, is indeed um, the constructive approach of describing these correlation functions starting from a random matrix Hamiltonian. So how, how would we do that? Yeah, you can ask yourself, how do you actually compute these correlation functions starting from a Gaussian distributed uh, random matrix? And um, <coughs> the answer is, or is that we, we again have to distinguish between the perturbative or semi-classical and the non-perturbative regime. The easier one is the perturbative one, the semi-classical regime, and that we can approach by perturbative expansion, by just doing perturbation theory in this Hamiltonian. So how does this go? We start by formulating um, some diagrammatic rules. Um, so we are thinking about green functions here retarded and advanced ones, say, and there is scattering, chaotic scattering of this random matrix Hamiltonian, and you can represent this perturbation theory in some, some, some perturbative diagrammatic language, just labeling here these matrix elements in this way and then starting drawing diagrams. I want to emphasize here <coughs> that playing with these diagrams is popular in our field, in quantum chaos, but also in particle physics. In particle physics, people also think about random matrices, but in a slightly different kind of uh, motivated cont context. This is um, the Toft large NQCD. And what you find in particle physics textbooks is a slightly different diagrammatic language, the so-called double line notation. It's the same problem, just represented in terms of slightly different graphical codes. Yeah? And um, in, in, in the context of chaos, it's, um, th this is a little more efficient. 
but um, please note, I mean, that <coughs> playing with these objects here is um, something we do both in quantum chaos and also in particle physics, uh, emphasizing slightly different questions. Yeah, this is something which will resurface. So coming back to our problem, how do we do spectral correlations? <coughs> we um, want to compute the correlations of two density of states, so we need a retarded and an advanced screen function, and then start doing perturbation theory in our Hamiltonian. So we draw lots of these, these, these lines and then try to compute what we get as, as, as good as we can. And um, what I want to get at next is that there are three different angles at which we can look at these, these diagrams, and they are all individually important for us. Um, the first <coughs> is to actually note that what we have here, this expansion, and, and this is the angle uh, emphasized in particle physics, this expansion is actually one in topology. There is a, uh, there is a notion of topology here. Uh, what, what we mean by topology is, suppose you look at this diagram, and you ask yourself, um, what is the um, genus of a minimal surface? I need to draw this diagram without any intersection of lines, so no, no crossing lines. Yeah? You can ask this question, and the answer is, um, it's a trivial one. You can do this on a sheet of paper. You don't see here any intersections of lines. Yeah? But then you can look at a slightly more complicated diagram, like this one, which is just higher order perturbation theory, and here you see you have intersections, say here and here. And you can ask the question, what is now? I mean, now I, on a sheet of paper, I will necessarily have these intersections. But if I took the same diagram and drew it on a torus, I mean, if I took a torus and would just pencil this, this particular diagram, there wouldn't be any intersections. So to each of these contributions in perturbation theory, and there is infinitely many, I can attach a label. I can I, I can label it by the genus, the number of holes, essentially, of the minimal surface I need to draw this diagram without intersections. From the perspective of quantum chaos, this may this is a weird question, why should I do that? But from the perspective of particle physics, it's a very, I mean, it's a, it's a key, I mean, crucially important question. Yeah? And here I w just want to emphasize that this can be done. It's an option. Yeah? We can, each diagram has a topological index attached to it. Was that clear? Um, now, in particle physics, people look at this perturbation theory. I mean, this perturbation theory is, is done in particle, and, and they tend to attack it by a tool they call topological recursion. And uh, in essence, this is the following. You, um, you draw all your, you, you, you think of all your diagrams. I mean, you just think of the whole set. And to each of them, you can associate a genus. So you, you sum over, you represent your correlation function as a sum over all these uh, genera. And what you also note is that for each intersection, you have to pay a price. I mean, the higher genus means smaller contribution of, of individual diagrams, and this price is the inverse Hilbert space dimension. So you write down a super formal series of this type. Yeah? You, you don't know the individual terms, but you know this series exists. And then they were smart enough to identify recursion relations. Namely, <coughs> all contributions of a given topological index can be recursively expressed in terms of those of lower index. So you can write down formal series recursion relations like this. And this is known as topological recursion approach to matrix theory. In chaos, nobody knows about this, or at least, I don't know, have you anybody ever heard about this? Um, I didn't. I mean, I learned this new. In, 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 in the field of matrix uh, QCD, this is uh, um, an, an important uh, concept. Good, so this is one way of interpreting um, this kind of um, our, our correlation functions. Um, now comes the one that is more familiar to us um, in chaos. We don't care about topology. What we do care about is singularity in our um, parameter <coughs> S, or essentially 1 over energy um, correlations. And um, you know that there is a leading order contribution to our spectral correlation function, which goes back to Berry. This is a Berry diagonal approximation, where you basically, in random matrix language, you sum over just these, these letter-type structures. In the language of periodic orbits, these are identical periodic orbits correlated with each other. This gives us a leading order contribution to our correlation function. I mean, um, and... Um, 
uh, in, in, uh, in certain units, this is an um, uh, S inverse uh, one contribution. Now, um, if you are, don't want to stop at that, then you do um, Sieber Richter. This would be the next one. I mean, which um, in uh, oh, well, this is not this is um, a genus two. I mean, uh, in this is uh, for the unitary ensemble. All I want to emphasize is that there are higher order contributions, and they give you higher order powers in one over s in this diagrammatic expansion. Yeah, and um, in in periodic orbits here, this I, periodic orbits. Did you do triple encounter? Did you discuss this? No, but I mean, so there, there is a there is a periodic orbit diagram where periodic orbits um, uh, come together in a so-called triple encounter. And in random matrix language, this is this beast here. If you really compute this, if you work this out, this diagram, you find that it scales um, with a higher power. Um, of, of 1 over s, and then you can write down the full series of diagrams and in this way reconstruct this, per this structure, perturbative structure of the correlation function. Clear? Yeah. yeah? Here's something which you will not know, and I, I, I learned new. I mentioned now two, two structures. There is this topological counting, and this way of counting emphasizing progressively higher powers of 1 over s. And they are intimately related. Namely, the 1 over s power you get for a given random matrix chaos diagram is identical to the topological index. So if you ask yourself, on what surface can I draw this beast here without any intersection, the answer is, again, is, is, is the torus, and here it's a sheet of paper. And this holds through. So the, there is something, something deep, mathematically deep, I, I'm sure, which I don't understand. Just empirically, we know that if you do this um, diagrammatic expansion and organize in powers of S, or do the organization in powers of topo in, uh, genus topology index, um, there is a perfect match. Yeah. So uh, th this is one of the things that becomes important when when it comes to gravity later on. Yes. Hmm? Where? Oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. This is, um, uh, so first of all, this is about um, time reversal. And what I'm using here is, I mean, this is a retarded green function. This is an advanced one. And they propagate in the same direction in time. Yeah. So this is a diagram which exists in the unitary case. In the orthogonal case, that would be the Sieber Richter diagram. Avoid it. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, two-dimensional. Two-dimensional surface with holes in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So think of, think of sphere, torus, torus with two handles, and, and so on. And uh, even, I mean, at some point it, it takes some while to just really sit down there, but to, to draw these things. But yeah. Okay. So that was number two of three ways of looking at this um, expansion. Now comes the third one. Ah, no. Um, before coming to the third one, conceptually, yeah, to take away uh, something. Mo we have now these two hierarchies. I mean, th of these diagrams, there is many, many, many. Yeah, of those, there is only very few. You see, there's very high degree of order here. This ladder structure, and here this ladder structure. So the way to think about it, or at least I think about it, is you have a huge set of diagrams of a given topological index, and there is only very few included in them. Very, f I mean, these regular guys, which are have this index, and in addition, are singular in one of ways. The, the majority of diagrams is just junk diagrams. They don't give you an interesting contribution to the spectral correlation function. They don't decay and no, 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 no power in 1 over s. They just give you a small constant. You don't care about this. There is these preciously few which you want to count, and they are included as subsets of a given topological index. Good. Now comes the third one. Um, <coughs> you draw. Diagrams of increasing order. Here's another one, and I mean, and and then you look at this and say, ah, this looks a bit like <coughs> some effective quasi-particle um, of a theory with some interacting theory. Yeah? You can interpret these as, as Feynman diagrams of, of uh, a theory with this here as a quasi-particle propagator and some weird nonlinear interactions. So that gives you the idea that maybe there is a quantum field theory around whose perturbative expansion are these diagrams. Yeah, and 
this theory indeed exists, and that is the nonlinear Sika model, which we discussed um, uh, in the, our talk on uh, SYK. So <coughs> there exists a very simple zero-dimensional, because it's an ergodic theory, there is no space here, no, nothing like that, theory where you integrate over some object, say, um, live in some space. I mean, in the simplest case, this is a sphere or a supersphere. And you have a very simple action depending on just one parameter, namely our S. There is no other parameter. This is the only dimensionless parameter. And if you do this integral now perturbatively, I mean, for large S, you can do perturbation theory and parameters these guys in terms of coordinates and write down diagrams, you get precisely these. Yeah? So this is here. This is the mean field theory of quantum chaos, which I mentioned before. It is the universal theory whose perturbative expansion are these diagrams. But importantly, you can do this integral also non-perturbatively for small s. For small s, you don't have a good perturbation theory, but you just do the integral. And then you get the non-perturbative part of the correlation functions. So um, what I want to stress is that this here is the quote-unquote phi to the four theory of quantum chaos. And I don't know a single exception to the rule that every ergodic quantum system is described by this beast here at long time scales. Yeah? Yeah? Hmm? Supergroup, yeah. Hmm? And no, n is the number of green functions you are probing. Green functions. Of the Grassmanns and the non Grassmanns? No. Uh, if you want to have a normalized integral that it's normalized to one, yes. So for, for everybody, the question was what this n is. And the answer is n is the number of green functions you are correlating with each other. In the simplest case, just two. Yeah? A retarded and advanced one, then it's two. And you can choose here different values of n for different observables. But for us, this is. Um, right, yeah. Okay. So that is more or less the end of um, the chaos uh, review. And any questions to this point? No? Um, yes. So now, now, now comes the weird part. Now we start to go into uh, gravity. Um, our starting point here is the second. Remember I mentioned chaos and the holographic principle. So what is the holographic principle? <coughs> in, in, in a super short formulation, it means the following. Um, there is a strong belief out there that if you consider d-dimensional gravitational systems, I mean, our case would be four-dimensional yeah, universe, but you can consider any dimension, um, they, they cast a shadow in the sense that their information or the, the, the physics is encapsulated in, a, in one dimension less, in the quantum theory in one dimension less. Yeah, this is the idea of the holographic uh, principle. Its origins go back to the 1980s, I mean, I mean or, or even earlier. I'm, I'm not good at this history. But what I do know is that um, Maldacena, in 1997, introduced a worked example of this. I mean, a really quite accurately worked example. Um, where <coughs> the gravitational theory was a somewhat exotic one, namely living in the product of a five-dimensional ADS5 space, anti zeta space, and a five-dimensional sphere. And the corresponding boundary partner was then a young Mills theory, so something like a um, version of a QCD, super young Mills with supersymmetry n equals four in four dimensions. So this, in this case, the correspondence has been made quite concrete. Um, on the level of correlation functions and everything, but uh, there is, um, I mean, it, it's in fact, uh, as far as I know, the only example that's been worked to this example, and it's also quite complicated. Yeah? And <coughs> um, this situation then motivated um, Kitaev in 2015 to ask the question if we if can't construct something much more simple. I mean, a, a simpler version of such a holographic correspondence and ideally one of an equal level of explicitness. 
And simple by definition was you take the lowest um, non-trivial gravitational theory. Maybe one can even think of a one-dimensional. But anyway, this is, I mean, two is probably the, uh, the, the lowest meaningful dimension. In which case, the boundary theory would have to be quantum in one dimension. And this one-dimensional coordinate on, in which the quantum mechanics and lifts is and naturally interpreted as a time-like variable, yeah? We have no space but time, a quantum theory. And what he also postulated is that we want a chaotic boundary theory, a chaotic quantum mechanics. And the challenge then was identify a good quantum mechanical model and a good gravitational model and, um, and uh, construct this correspondence. And an important ally in this construction was quantum chaos. I mean, both were made simple by requiring, I mean, if you want ergodicity and hence a maximal level of entropy and simplicity. Now, the boundary theory he proposed was, was the SYK model, Majorana SYK, which we discussed. Oh, sorry, that's mine. Um, no, it wasn't mine. Um, so here it is again, our, our um, model with uh, N Majoranas, um, these commutation relations made random. And this model really um, checks the boxes. Um, my, somehow the pointer doesn't seem, but it's still on. Some of my computer froze. Can this be? Let me just check. <coughs> ah, no. That's still there. So, um, it's uh, one-dimensional, so uh, one-dimensional in the sense of quantum mechanics, and it's hard quantum chaotic. There is another checkbox which I sh could write here. Um, the model has a very high degree of internal symmetry, which you don't see with your naked eye, but if you look at it closely, you find that it realizes some kind of conformal invariance. And maybe some of you have heard this name ADS-CFT. I mean, so... Um, the best candidates for holographic principle constructions are those where your boundary theories um, support a conformal symmetry, and this SYK model has it. But I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to discuss this any further. Yet. But it, it's a it's a good model to start with. Yeah, that was Kitao's point. And these controls, do they? Can you live with them? Or I mean, these zoom controls appeared again, but yeah. So I already mentioned, um, but I, I don't have to repeat this here, this model is, is hard quantum chaotic all the way down to the lowest energy scales. So that's nice. Uh, but now the question is, what about this? Um, I mean, how, how should we think about this holography stuff? And the way I, I, I think about it is as follows. Um, suppose you consider an imaginary time partition sum. So just write down the quantum partition sum trace e to the minus beta, beta is inverse temperature times h. Now there are two different ways in terms of which we can think about this beast. We can say this beta, uh, inverse temperature, is something like an imaginary time. And um, this being so, we can take the Fourier transform and construct an imaginary energy green function. I mean, these two are Fourier transform related. Now we have here a green function with a chaotic Hamiltonian, and we are in business. We can do spectral correlations and these games, which we always like to play. Yeah? I mean, so to start drawing diagrams and so on. This is a chaos way of uh, looking at it. In holography, you would argue differently. You would say beta is like a uh, periodic coordinate. It's, I mean, so this imaginary time is periodic boundary conditions. So you think of this as a quantum theory or living on a circle, namely the imaginary time circle. Yeah? And now you interpret this as a boundary of something, and this something is a two-dimensional surface. And you declare the goal of constructing a theory here which has this boundary theory in the sense of a holographic shadow correspondence. So you, you want to know what is this. Yeah? So this is the, the holographic now comes a super important point <coughs> um, where chaos and holography interfere in a way. 
and it goes like this. We, we know that for a single green function, the single one of these is trivial in chaos. Yeah? We, to get something interesting in chaos, you always have to have at least two green functions to compute correlations. Otherwise, everything is structuralist and boring. So we need two of these, two boundary theories, if you want. And then we can start correlating them by averaging over disorder or energy or something else. So we, we, we think of spectral correlations. Yeah? Okay. Now, on the holography side, if we considered this here, um, there wouldn't be any correlation. This would be two different universes which don't talk to each other. So, so this doesn't do the trick. But the holographic um, idea, the holographic dictionary, instructs us um, if we have a given boundary, which now has here these two circles, not to consider this surface, but any surface that has our boundaries, namely these two here as a, as, as a boundary, that means this stuff should be included. And in the language of this field, um, uh, this, these, these guys are called um, Euclidean wormholes. So they are somehow wormhole structures uh, correlating these kind of uh, boundaries. Um, <coughs> we uh, shouldn't just look at this kind of wormhole, but um, also this one, yeah, in higher topologies. And um, again, in the parlance of the field, this is like uh, called the splitting of a mini universe. So you have here one universe, and it branches out in two, and later recombines. And um, notice that there is a topology creeping in here at this point. Yeah. So this is a surface of a higher topological genus than the one we had before. So uh, topology is again um, entering the, the stage. Another important point, and that's one which causes a lot of debate in, in the field of um, holography, is the following. In, in Maldacena's holographic correspondence, we had a sharp correspondence between one precise boundary theory and one precise gravity theory. So here in this game, it's slightly different. We are The holographic principle is a statistical one, namely that the gravitational theory um, in a way describes the statistical correlations or the averaged properties of um, two quantum theories. So it, it, this here describes an ensemble averaged, um, ensemble averaged physics of, of what is living at the boundary. So this is a conceptual difference and one that is creating a lot of unrest in the, in the particle community. So they, anyway, but I just want to mention this, there's a difference here. Okay, so this is a setting um, and everybody can draw such a picture, but of course now the crucial question is what kind of gravity should live here? We have drawn a surface, but the fluctuations of this surface, think of it as a dynamical object in a way, or fluctuating object. I mean, uh, what should I put here? What kind of theory lives here? And already in 2015 or 16, uh, immediately after this SYK thing came up, um, an answer was given. And the answer was, uh, what we want to put here is so-called Yakiv Teitelbaum gravity. Yakiv Teitelbaum gravity. So what is that? Um, le le let me first show you what it is, and then uh, let's try to make friends with it. It's a um, gravitational theory that is described by some action. Now, if, if this doesn't mean anything to you, let me just um, uh, maybe remind you or tell you the following. That gravity is described by Einstein equations. Yeah, there is the Einstein equations. And the Einstein equations are e equations of motion, in a way, um, describing fluctuations of a metric in space-time. And as such, like all equations of motion in physics, they can be derived or derived from a variational principle. So like Maxwell or you have Lagrange equations um, coming from a Lagrange action. And the same in gravity. Now, how do these actions typically look like? <coughs> um, they are actions where you integrate, I mean, you integrate a metric, fluctuations of a metric against these, the metric is always called G. And what you then typically integrate is um, so-called um, uh, Riemann curvature of your, of, of your space. So you obtain an action of the structure integral over, this is the, the canonical volume element here times the uh, Riemann curvature. And then you find that if you vary these actions right on the Euler-Lagrange equation, you get the Einstein equations. Now, you can play this game in all dimensions. And in two dimensions, it's natural to write um, this one here. In the physics of holography, um, we always live in a space of uh, 
in the universe of negative curvature. These are these so-called anti desitta like uh, geometries. And uh, this information is implemented here by adding a negative cosmological constant, so some, some constant reaction. But this is something you can write down. And now there is a claim that this um, gravity theory here is holographically dual to the SYK model. Yeah. So, the, and then of course the question is, how, how do we know? I mean, wh wh why why is this so? And the answer is um, as follows, or was was formulated as follows. We have two theories: the boundary theory now and this weird gravity theory, and there exist two different bridges between these, two independent bridges, yeah, which establish the correspondence. The first is operating at um, short time physics, so they. Um, we are addressing here, in the SYK context, fluctuations and correlations and so on, um, on time scales of the order of the number of particles. So we, are, we are again have this kind of distinction here between short time physics and later comes long time physics. And in the on the SYK side, <coughs> um, here you have phenomena like operator scrambling and I mean all what was, was discussed at great length here at this school. And the SYK model is friendly enough to provide us with an effective, simple action, the so-called Schwarzian action. It's an approximate description of the SYK model at these time scales. And it describes all these phenomena. Now, this Schwarzian action, the very same effective action, which I'm not showing here, also describes JT physics at the same, if you want, time scales. So the JT model. If you do the integral and um, you can do it, you can argue that it reduces to the same effective action, the complicated um, integral over the gravity, and this provides one with a very strong, albeit uh, approximate bridge between these two. Okay, that was um, is our first piece of evidence. The second one is formulated at long times. I mean, now, now we go to this long time limit and look again at SYK. And what we have there is what we discussed. I mean, we have random matrix universality in this model. So we have a 1 over s expansion for spectral correlations. And you can also think of this as, a, uh, as an element of a topological expansion. Yeah? So we, we have all this, these things we discussed here at long times. And um, the beauty of the thing is now that in JT, we have a very similar, in, in fact, quantitatively identical expansion. But where our starting point now is the JT path integral instead of uh, the periodic orbit or, or impurity scattering or chaos diagrams. So this is something I would like to discuss now, how, how to, um, I mean, or sketch, how to establish this correspondence here. Yeah? And um, it starts by, <coughs> by looking, uh, we will be very schematic here, I just want to give you the idea. We look at the gravitational partition sum. So what have we do to do? Our, our friend here is the, I mean, we have to integrate over all configurations of the metric, weighted by this um, Einstein-Hilbert-like um, action. And we organize this path integral as follows. We first sum over, um, we, we need to integrate over all geometries, yeah? It's an integral over geometries. So we first, um, uh, organizes by summing over all topologies. I mean, like cylinder geometry, then with one handle, two handle, increasing more complex um, geometries, meaning increasingly many holes or mini universe splittings, if you want. Then for each additional hole, it turns out that you have to pay a hefty price, which is known as a black hole entropy here. Um, what you then have to do is for each given geometry, you need to integrate over the fluctuations of this geometry in a given topological sector. And finally, we have two boundaries. So we, these boundaries can also fluctuate a little. You integrate over that, and you weigh all this with an action, which I mentioned is the approximately the, the Schwarzian action, which I mentioned. And the, the picture behind it is, is like here. So we have two boundaries. So this would be, for example, one contribution with some boundary wiggles, and you have this one, or you have a wormhole connecting them, and a wormhole with lots of mini-universes. You have to sum over all this. And what helps you a lot is um, 
the structure of this two-dimensional action, which essentially means that these geometries, they are not too different, so, um, I mean, locally, and you can actually do these integrals to a far degree uh, uh, quantitatively. What you cannot do is doing the integral in closed form. I mean, you cannot write down the, the answer, what it is. Yeah, but at least we have this series. So you you don't have to integrate as well of the uh, dilaton to fix the, oh, the, the uh, curvature. Yeah. I tried to sweep this under the rug. Yeah, there was this little. Yeah, very good. Uh, there, so there there was a little phi field in my action, which is the dilaton field. I mean, I okay, okay. Um, and yes, the answer is yes. So it's Einstein-Hilbert action coupled to a uh, to a scalar field, but um, and you you have to integrate over everything that was. Oh. Yes. And um, so, so, so the, 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 the mindset here is you can write down this um, hierarchy. You have some, some geometric constraints that simplify the things a little, but you cannot do the integral in total. You shouldn't expect it. It's too complicated. What you can do, however, is the following. You can look at contributions. This is here for four boundaries of given topologies, <laughs> and then take a knife and, and think a lot and write down recursive relations between contributions of a given topology to those of lower topology. So it's a very similar game to what, what I mentioned previously in this topological recursion and matrix theory. And this kind of um, hierarchy construction is due to Mirza Kani. She was, I mean, she got a Fields Medal for that um, in mathematics. Um, this, uh, uh, integral over these, these kind of um, uh, surface structures and the organization, hierarchical organization in different topologies. So it's a very famous work in math. And what we have now is we have now two forms of topological recursion, if you want. Yeah? Those for our matrix diagrams and those on the gravitational side. And you can ask yourself, I mean, how are they connected? And this is, I mean, uh, so it's a way, this is like a Rosetta Stone work, yeah? We have two descriptions, d different codes of perhaps the same. And it turns out that they are quantitatively identical. So there is a, it's not just a qualitative agreement, but there is, um, there is a quantitative agreement between these two respective topological recursions. This is a purely mathematical statement. But it, it, it gets contents when you notice that here, this topological recursion um, has the information about quantum chaos in it. Yeah, it knows about the expansion of correlation functions. So the same information must sit here. So corollary, we already learned that um, our gravitational path integral is in a way quantum chaotic. And this kind of correspondence was, um, I mean, we, we owe this in principle due to this work of Ena and Orantin on the matrix side and um, Mirzakhani on the, um, um, if you want, math side. But it was made concrete in a paper where the reference is here, Schenker, Stanford, and Saad, 2015. Um, and the, the, the statement is as follows. I essentially said it. I mean, formulate recursive relations of topological expansion in JT and then compare <coughs> to the topological recursion not of the SYK model itself, but rather of a matrix model, a, a random matrix model, which is engineered to have the boundary density of states of the SYK, the cinch square root, which we, we discussed. So you write down a matrix model with the spectral density and then do topological recursion of that. And you find that there's a perfect match. It's just perfectly um, related. Now, knowing this, since this is holds as an abstract topological statement, we know that um, in our all these um, contributions that he accounted, we have these one over s singular terms. And since they exist in the matrix side, they must also exist in the gravity side. And that is, um, in a way, um, state of the art. I mean, it was state of the art until 2020 or so. So. Um, the statement is that perturbatively, in the semi-classical expansion type, um, we <coughs> the, the gravitational path integral is quantum chaotic, and it, it behaves like an ergodic quantum system. Yeah, super strong result, I think. Any questions? Or no? No? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, um, we have our reference model proxy system for quantum chaos, the random matrix model, which is funny density of states. We know you are quantum uh, chaotic. It has these spectral correlations. It, it has these hierarchies of diagrams describing these spectral correlations. And a very similar, no, not similar, but identical perturbative expansion is found on the gravitational side. And from that, we learn that this kind of um, two-dimensional theory, gravitational theory, um, having this SYK as a boundary, is quantum chaotic. So, but what we, what we, we, we have established this quantum chaos only perturbatively so far, meaning in the sense of a diagram expansion. What we do not yet understand, and this is what the next question I would get, that where is the non-perturbative part? Yeah, before, remember, so um, we had um, I, I argued spectral correlation function have this non-perturbative part which knows actually about level spacings. Only at large energies do we have this um, perturbative expansion. And now we want to be more ambitious and ask where is the non-perturbative part? And my own take on this is um, that it's not in this gravity theory. Why? Because the gravity theory, by definition, assumes the form of a sum. So it's, it's I think of it conceptually as something like a Goodswiller sum. Goodswiller, Goodswiller trace formula? Did you do that here? I mean, so it's, it's philosophically similar. Yeah? You, sum, you actually sum explicitly, manually, over periodic orbit contributions. In order to get something non-perturbative from Goodswiller, you have to do some white magics. I mean, play with some unitarity constraints and, and, and whatever. And people have done the same for JT, in fact, very recently, 2022. But one can argue or ask the following question. I mean, suppose we think of this JT as a path integral description of something. Um, where is the underlying quantum theory, the really the, the hardcore quantum theory? And then if you think a little further, I mean, or I'll, uh, ask, see what, study what they tell you in, in, in textbooks on string theory. They say that um, we have string theory as a kind of a candidate theory of, of, of gravitational, um, or of the fusion of gravity and quantum mechanics. And semi-classically, string theory reduces to gravity, to these gravitational path integrals. So there is a, when, when, when starting to think in a direction, maybe there is some string theory, which actually is more quantum than this one here, and hopefully has the non-perturbative part in it. And we, we have been chasing for this for a number of years. I mean, this, um, so what happened in 2022 is that um, Verlinde and um, a student of his, they actually formulated a string theory which has JT as a, as a semi-classical limit. Yeah? Huh? It's target space and the world sheet space are two-dimensional, yes. No, no, yeah, right. And in fact, all what I'm saying is, if you, if you, since you know this, is, on, is formulated for the uh, world sheet space of the string theory. So, um, this theory is known as Codera Spencer um, string field theory. And let me just very quickly try to give the idea of how strings sneak in here. So, they, they call it the universe string field theory of JT gravity. And the way I think about it is as follows. Here's again a JT cartoon, yeah? And think of this now as some kind of um, semi-classic or representation of Feynman diagrammatic representation of a quantum theory. And this here is some kind of um, uh, transition probability between two boundary um, uh, amplitudes. And I want to take a knife and cut it and think of this here as an amplitude, as something like a quantum mechanical scattering amplitude. And what it is, is, is it's really a scattering, I mean, this is the scattering amplitudes you find in a string theory textbooks of um, closed strings. So you have a closed string, which is essentially a string closed, and it scatters here into two, um, uh, I mean, two final closed strings, and you can think of this here as a, as a nonlinear vertex describing string scattering. And the JT theory as the effective semi-classical low energy theory um, uh, corresponding to this. Now the question is, is there a quantum theory, I mean, really a quantum mechanical theory, um, having this here as the elementary scattering vertex, and everything is two-dimensional here, so the situation is so simple that the answer is, is affirmative. 
uh, you can f formulate that, and that is this so-called Codera Spencer. Um, and what is this Codera Spencer? I mean, how, mathematically, um, it's the following. It, I mean, technically, it assumes the form of a two-dimensional conformal field theory. So I, I'm just telling this. Yeah, I'm not explaining it. I'm just telling you. Um, there is a string theory which is mathematically assumes the form of a um, 2 d CFT of what? If you n have heard conformal field theory jargon of a, of a, a single scalar chiral boson with a cubic nonlinearity, this cubic nonlinearity is the scattering amplitude. It is defined on a um, Riemann surface, on a two dimensional theory, which actually, strangely, is not space here, but this is the space, um, it's, it's, uh, the surface is energy. It's a complex energy manifold with a uh, branch cut in it along which you have a final uh, finite density of state. So it's all a bit but it's, it's a bit weird if one hears it for the first time. But um, if you accept that, I mean, I'm not even writing you the action here, yeah? But if you accept that and do perturbation theory now in this cubic nonlinearity, really perturbation theory for two-dimensional field theory, you uh, rediscover JT. So this is order by order, you get the JT contributions. But since this is a CFT, you can do actually non-perturbative calculations. I mean, the conformal field theory, they have to give you a strong tailwind. Um, and uh, what um, you can do is you can source the theory in a way that you need to compute uh, green functions. And now I, I just want to flash some formulas. I mean, you I, to emphasize that there is some, some calculations Calculations, so you, you calculate, calculate a bit with formulas, and um, once you are done, ta ta, you have the nonlinear Sika model. So this theory checks the box. It reduces in the proper limit to our um, low energy effective mean field theory of quantum chaos, now non perturbatively. And that means that it has all the information on board, and there is really not much of an assumption here. All two pies and everything really checks. So this is um, there's n nothing phenomenological. Once you have the theory, you do the calculation, you arrive here, and from here you can now do perturbation theory and get your diagrams again, or you go non-perturbatively. So the conclusion is that this is a um, baby example of a string theory, two-dimensional, super, I mean, reduced, but it is quantum chaotic. And that means that in this string theory, the string theory describes the quantum theory via the fluctuations of its strings. And this quantum theory has universal spectral correlations. And it has a finite level spacing. And we, it's natural to interpret this as a statistics of a spectrum of a black hole in, the, in this context. Yeah? So that's, um, uh, and well, this is not uh, for you. So what, this is kind of the, the landscape here. We have SYK. <laughs> I argued that perturbatively, this is um, we have via chaos, it's bridged to JT. JT is also a perturbative limit of the string theory, but here we have a solid link. And um, um, that I kind of think is, is, is kind of nice. So this is the, the string theory is a statistical partner of, of this quantum boundary theory. Yeah. Um, now this is so weird that. At this point, there is only one or two groups, uh, so we, we need more people uh, in this field. Um, there, there is, I mean, lots of interesting things one can one can do here. But um, uh, yeah, I hope perhaps I managed to get some of you a bit interested, and I, I stop here. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, th thanks for the talk. I, I remember, if I'm not wrong, that if you want to like include matter fields, oh, yeah. so you have to, at the end, like take a matrix model with two matrices. One, yes. they have the typical Hamiltonian for the spectral part, and yes. the, uh, well, the, 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 the other matrix for the other for the matter yeah. fields. So yes. in this uh, case, in the supersymmetric case, where is the, the, the part of the matter fields? Um, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> What I do know is that I can point you to a 160-page paper, <laughs> uh, which I never dare to. Uh, by it's by my co-author, I mean you, you, Julian Sonner. We did this here with Sonner and Verlinde, and Sonner is a string theorist uh, who learns the language of chaos, 
And he wrote a paper precisely about this, I mean, coupling matter to conformal matter to JT, and how to describe this in matrix model language. There's a two matrix model out there. And um, I think it's a super good, cool question to lift this to this non perturbative framework. And I haven't dared looking into this. But one should do it. I mean, it's a very good, good problem. Mm -hmm. OK, so uh, thank you for the lecture. Mm -hmm. And no, so you make a one-to-one a, a -one correspondence on like the diagrams from, from like scattering and, and disorder yeah. stuff and uh, some over geometries, right? So yes. I was just wondering if there's like a, some sort of intuition as to what exactly are you expanding on to lead to this sum over geometry? Like what's causing the yeah. different geometries in the diagrams? Ah, uh, yeah, that, that's something I, I think I can answer. Um, I know that Juan Diego is and, and Klaus Richter are also thinking. It's, it's a very good question to think about. And it, um, the answer goes like this. Um, at least as one way of answering. You can consider JT in the limit of very long times, I mean, very large boundaries. And there is some kind of area conservation in the game, meaning that in this case, you should think of it a bit like this here. And there's a very small guy here. So, and, and this is uh, called a ribbon. And now, you are, if you have higher topologies, we get um, geometric structures which are, which are called ribbon graphs. Yeah? So they, they brand, th think of a handle here. And, and these ribbon graphs um, are in one-to-one -one correspondence to contributions of a cubic, of a, of a random matrix model with a cubic nonlinearity. So you write down a matrix model which has this vertex. Um, so, and now you can start drawing ribbons here. And, and diagrams. And what's important is that these diagrams <coughs> describe the fluctuations. These diagrams describe the fluctuations of a Gaussian distributed random matrix right at the edge. If you go right to the spectral edge, I mean, you know, you have a Wigner semicircle and start drawing matrix diagrams. Um, they, there at the edge, they assume this form, and we know how they translate to the uh, um, periodic orbit diagrams. Um, if you go a little away from the edge. So we have, we have a way going from geometry over this matrix. And you, you, you should think of this here, you know, in quantum gravity, they like to discretize surfaces in terms of triangularizations. Sorry? Triangularizations. If you have a surface, like in a, you want to build a car, and you put it on a, on a computer, you, you, you discretize it in terms of tiny little triangles. So this is philosophically quite closely related. So you, you take a smooth um, theory, you first go to a limit, then you go to a matrix discretization in terms of this cubic theory, from there to the random matrix model. Um, so this is one way of um, <coughs> understanding the... One thing which, is, which I personally find mind-boggling, and I know that these guys as well, is that in periodic orbit theory, when we write down the encounters, we always need retarded and advanced green functions to, to get action cancellation. Here in this business, you also get orbits for a single, single green function, yeah, and they are kind of important. So, um, this is something to have in mind when we try to think about actual uh, periodic orbit representations or something like that. But uh, it's also I'm mumbling, yeah. So there is there are some open questions out there, but in principle, one can have these connections. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, okay. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, okay, people continue discussing later. Thank you.